We met on the first day of school in the seventh grade. Haley was sitting all alone at a lunch table by the overcast window with her wild curly hair and uniquely pale complexion. I was immediately fascinated and transfixed enough to go sit across from her. Our friendship was immediate as we bonded over Phantom of the Opera, gothy Tim Burton movies, and filmmaking. We spent the first two weeks of our time together plotting out a horror film we wanted to create using my old video camera. And with that came the first of many sleepovers in late August. We spent a few hours running through the woods in her backyard making silly preteen filmmaker footage before Haley suggested that we go check out the hobo house down the road. We crossed the street from her home and walked next to the road towards an embedded path alongside the power line towers, diving deeper into the wilderness until we came across an old house in which the entire basement had been ripped apart. We walked a bit further into the woods until the trees opened again and passed under an oversized tree that felt off to me, though Haley didn't seem to notice. When I turned, I stopped short and looked up in shock. I had grown up in a haunted house, so wasn't immune to spirit activity. However, I was not prepared for a woman to be hanging in the tree, staring directly at my friend. I said nothing as we left the area. It was the first of many frightening experiences with her. Like a magnet and conductor, strange things always happened when we were together. The weird part is, it felt as though she was the one being targeted with the hauntings, as though they were coming for her. Cereal boxes would often fly off the refrigerator when we were home alone. We would hear knockings, and some awful blood-red photography lights in her bathroom would flick themselves on. This was only the beginning, because things grew worse. One night, as we laid in her bed, there was a horrible roar from the woods of her backyard, like a combination between a boar and a human, and the crumpling of compressed leaves. I stared with wide eyes at her leaflet curtains and prayed it was my imagination. I'll never forget how I felt when she asked if I had heard it too. I swallowed and didn't say a word as the marching footsteps made their way past the back porch and towards the side of the house, closer to where her window was. I knew I would faint if I heard that sound again. We both sprang out of bed in a rush of adrenaline when a power drill from the hallway closet went off, vibrating against her wall. I snapped on the light while she ripped open the curtain. Nothing was outside, and nothing was in the hallway. The drill was unplugged, the cord wrapped around the handle. We didn't sleep all night and didn't even dare to go to the bathroom. Even with all this, nothing could prepare me for what happened that Halloween. Haley decided to be the corpse bride, so we managed to find an old wedding dress at a thrift shop. We took the gown home and covered it in dirt and cool-toned paints. Halloween went as normal as we trick-or-treated with friends in the local neighborhoods. The mother of a friend had brought a wind-up disposable camera to take pictures with all night, often snapping photos of us without a thought. It makes me nauseated to think about what they found on the camera once the pictures were developed, even after 12 years. The family called Haley's mother in concern and would not let us see them for some time. In the photos, everything and everyone was normal, except for Haley. It started with a few black spots on her cheeks, but with each picture flip, her skin became bluer and more malformed. Her teeth became blacker and almost rotted, looking in the light no matter her position in the photo. Her blue eyes began to shrink into two inky little pits in the photo, and then they wouldn't let us see the last few. Looking back, I'm thankful they didn't let us see. We put the dress in her parents' attic and swore to never bring it down again. I never knew what they did with the photos. I moved to a new school one year later and our friendship faded out through high school. I will say though, 
but our frightening memories together continue to be as clear as day. Hi, I'm Jamie Markey. And I'm Michael Tatum, and this... Is Cool Intentions. Welcome, Ooh. foolish mortals. <laughs> and intelligent mortals, all the mortals. <laughs> you know what, and the immortals. And the, or the, or the past extra mortal, mortal? the past po- post-mortal. Beyond mortal. <laughs> <laughs> all the ghosticles. We all, love you guys, everybody. All are, all are welcome. All, all are, welcome are welcome here. here. <laughs> uh... So Ooh, that was a creepy story. That was story. such a good story. Mm-hmm. And that was from Mary Quite Contrary. Oh. Such a good story. It's a great family. Um, yeah. <laughs> Mary is also a ghost hunter. So oh, nice. that was exciting to me. Um, such contrary a of the Quite Contraries? Oh, well. Oh, well. I heavens. believe we're cousins. <laughs> Not Mary Rather Contrary, but <laughs> yeah. quite, quite. Yes, I, I come from the Texas Contrarians. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> different offshoot. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just a general contrarian. Uh, so, um, but yeah, thank you so much for that story. It was just lovely. Very, yeah. very well told. And Great imagery too. Ooh, Ooh. Gosh, Ooh. makes you wonder. Ooh. Makes you not ever want to get married. It's true. It's true. At least don't go as a corpse bride. Yikes. Yikes. Ooh. The moral of the story is all brides end up dead inside. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, or just dead. It's an indictment I mean, of the whole institution of marriage. Right? It's, inevitably. If it were a piece of literature, that's how I'd read it. Yeah. In- inevitably, though, it, they, all brides die. That's just fact. Well, thanks for Everyone. bringing the room down. I mean, everybody <laughs> does. It's just the facts. <laughs> I, you know, uh, what's our okay. what's the title name today's today? title do we really bad about <laughs> talking about the title in the episode but t- we're gonna i know about that today we realized maybe at least one if not two weeks, one or two we totally like, oh, forgot yeah, to say the title <laughs> <laughs> we work on them though we break we, we do them, we just we get lost and then in the we conversation. stop talking about it. okay so the title of today's episode is called the wonderful discovery Mm. And that comes from a book written in 1612 by Thomas Potts, and the book is called The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster. Ooh. Now, it sounds really positive, like, like you know, a Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory kind right. of thing, but it's not. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's not. And Wonderful th- meant, like... Full of wonder, like yeah. in the supernatural sense. Like, I guess. what the fuck? Had a different meaning. It should be the what the fuck discovery of witches. <laughs> the what the fuck discovery of yes, witches. Yes. And so they just that use is our words title. differently back then. That's right. And it uh, certainly applies to yours, but it's actually mm-hmm. uh, uh, exactly what my story is about. The book, uh, that book. And those tr- the witch trials specifically that the book talks Ooh. about is what I'm going to talk about. Ooh. But I'm not first. You are. I know. I love witchy stuff. I just witchy do. woman. I love yeah. it. You see, you've too. seen the movie The Witch, right? I think we've talked about. Oh it my here god, it's so good. So yes. fucking great. If you I haven't seen it. The Witch, but I'm definitely no spoilers. It. But by the end of it, I really am just the sort of person that just kind of watches the last scene and goes. Good for her. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm like, good for her. Same reaction. What <laughs> Which are your options? Horrifies some people. I'm like, you know what? You did the best that you could That's for yourself. Right. Considering. What are your um, fucking options yeah, here? Like this, you just don't. Your family doesn't understand you. No. <laughs> Look, your father cut you up in the fucking wilderness. <sighs> like it's whatever. And that girl who played that character. Such a good actress. She's so good, but she also looks so much like I'm gonna show you a picture of mm-hmm. one of my friends, Maria, her daughter. Really? Oh my god, they look Ooh. she looks so much like her. And so when I was watching it, I couldn't not see Sammy as that oh. character. It was I and then I texted Maria. I was like, please don't ever go see this movie. It will mess with you. I love that so much of the film's dialogue comes from actual testimony, court testimony mm-hmm. taken from witch trials at the yes. time, which is uh oof. Makes it a little difficult to understand because they they keep with the the argo of the time. Yes. But um, man, does it make it creepy? Like, oh, these are conversations people actually had. Yeah. Holy fuck! Uh-huh. It's crazy. It's yeah. crazy to think about. But I love witchy stuff. I don't know. <clears throat> I think for me, as we as we as we're inching ever closer to Halloween, it's not too far away. No. And I always think of Halloween as the season of the witch. You know, like mm-hmm. ghosts and goblins, all that good stuff. But like witches, I don't know. I always wanted Seriously. to be. A witch or a warlock or a wizard when I was a kid. I yeah. just, I really badly wanted to. Well, who doesn't want to do magic? I mean, some people are, you know, really turned off by the idea, I suppose. Yeah. But I was like, 
I was always attracted to stories that dealt with a kind of Faustian bargain. Mm -hmm. I just got obsessed with it. I think most most good kids would hear the story of Faust or or some variation that you know some folklore variation and go, "Oh my God, that's a moral." The moral of the story is like whatever. But I'd be like, "Wait, you can? The devil will do stuff for you? If you, <laughs> you can? I can? He takes meetings? Like, <laughs> I, I, he takes like meetings? where do I go?" <laughs> I was a weird kid, so I was always. I like, mean, like, I at least got to hear him out. Yeah, I mean, let's no, see. You know, there's a really, there's the a devil. funny, there's a really funny scene from. Um, oh, what's the animated show called? It's it's the. Um, uh, it, it's uh, oh god, fucking big I'm, mouth. No, 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 no. It's it's older than that. It's oh. a few. It's like um, mid two thousands, and it's uh, d the band name. It's a, a death metal band called Death Clock, mm. and um, at some point they go to the crossroads, the infamous crossroads at midnight. Metal, uh, like where like the blues musicians Ocal went. Metal apocalypse. Yeah. yeah, and uh, they go and meet the devil on the crossroads after midnight. And there's this really funny scene where it's, they build up to it. They're all out there, and like the clock strikes twelve or something, and they down the road comes like this really cool looking hearse slash Rolls Royce and out steps the devil who's just a dapper gentleman but he's got one like heterochromia or something and <laughs> he steps out and he's like you make a deal with me kind of thing and then it flashes forward to all of them of course being professional musicians looking at this contract and be like yeah i don't like this you get a lot on the back end here i don't really like that <laughs> also your marketing god no i don't no, like and they're just right. like and he's like and they're like okay well what about this we made a few changes to the contract and the, even the devil is like um I'm going to have to sleep on it and I'll get back to you. And then he takes off. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. So, so I decided. Mm, the, speaking of the devil. The way, speaking of the devil, I found the person I'm talking about today. So a few uh, episodes ago, I talked about the tragic and mysterious death of Mozart. So I, doing the research for the episode about the death of Mozart, I uh, came across a podcast called Case Notes. It's a little mini podcast. I've only, they've only got six or seven episodes, and that's okay. all they've ever done. I don't think they plan on doing more, uh, which is a shame. But it deals with like sort of the darker side of the classical musical world, like as they're looking at like the death of Mozart and mm -hmm. the death of Tchaikovsky, which was very controversial and mysterious. Um, also, the missing head of Joseph Haydn. All kinds of crazy stuff. And in it, I found a composer who I'd never heard of before, and I was like, I started looking into him. Him and thought, oh my God, this is a great subject for our podcast, yeah. as it turns out. I mean, even the name. So I give to you the strange case of Peter Warlock. Ooh. So this is fun. And of course, I'm a big music nerd, so this is just right up my fucking alley. So uh, music and religion have been arm in arm since either one of them became a thing, right? In fact, most experts agree that music arose uh, first and foremost as a component of ritual and later splintered off into the various quote-unquote profane forms that we all like to rock out to today. Um, <laughs> profane. But yeah, well, that's what's good. There was sacred and profane. Right. Uh, that was, yeah. There was a distinction, especially in the medieval era. Now, the agnostic music lover in me often wonders whether the opposite is true, that maybe, just maybe, organized religion grew out of the need to formalize the emotions that wash over us when, say, we hear a beautiful singing voice or we're kind of caught up in a rhythm of a dance or something. Right. Um, either way, like, their mutual origins are so entwined that it's impossible to, to pry them apart. Many people, whether they have religious affiliations of any kind or not, often can hear music and, and feel something akin to a spiritual state mm -hmm. um, that's music just has that kind of power and uh like the actors and and playwrights of ancient greece for example thought of the theater as a sacred space and music was an integral part of that and it's music that was now lost to us we don't even know how they used to notate it um and these are just some examples of some actual mystics that that had very oh, deep yeah? relationships with with music uh hildegard uh, hildegard von uh bingen uh, was one of the earliest known female composers and she uh wrote reams of liturgical music in the 12th century attempting to convey the mystical visions with which she'd been afflicted since childhood. Um, troubadours wandered Europe in the Middle Ages singing odes to chivalry and romantic love, but their doing so actually subtly shifted the landscape of religious thought away from just blind devotion to texts people didn't understand, unless you spoke Latin, most people didn't, right. uh, to a more personal relationship with God. Yeah, right. Well, and it, that owes a lot to the troubadours and their mission to kind of go out and sing and, and you know, just kind of extol the virtues of romantic love and all that. It was right. very, it, they didn't expect to do that, but it did. Yeah. It changed well, the face of religious it thought. It spoke in a language that people understood. It did. Yeah. It did. So it and wasn't it also, about sitting there and listening to, you know, somebody speaking Latin at you, mm -hmm, right? It mm -hmm. was 
you know, oh, this is something that I can relate to. And, yeah. and, 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 and it gives me it, feelings. It imbued it with kind of a heightened emotionality that kind of was still relatable because right. everyone's been in love. Everyone's, you know, been jilted, which is what mm -hmm. most of those songs are about. And but they could be swept up in that music. And so, you know, religious leaders started kind of using music a little more instructively like oh let's do that that oh yeah. we can really get them on board well especially when um, you think of like catholicism and lutheranism mm -hmm. specifically they are very creed driven very much you know so. so you have your creeds well how do you memorize you memorize the creed that's part mm -hmm. of it and i don't mm -hmm. know if they did it back then but um frequently you know the, well, speaking of Catholics, do they do that in latin and you don't speak latin yeah, you know, it's just you just hear it as kind of music yeah. in your head without really knowing what the words mean. Saint Francis, speaking of Catholic Saint of Francis Assisi? of Assisi, one of my favorite saints. I know um, he penned body songs as a young man before receiving a vision that left him with the stigmata. After which he wrote and played solely to the glory of Christ. He's like, I don't want that to happen again, so I'm not going to. Write. <laughs> no but, more body. But music was still very much part of his life. He just yeah. kind of shaped it differently. Um, there's a composer that I'm very fond of uh, named Alexander Skriabin who developed into an outstanding figure uh, only after the religious the religion theosophy made it into his works he was a follower of that the, the blavatsky school of that that's a whole episode yeah but, i'm like i don't know um, what the fuck you're it's talking a kind about. of it was a late victorian <laughs> era alternative religion oh okay. um founded uh, in large part by madame blavatsky who was the sort of thought to be the 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 godmother of the spiritualist movement oh okay, okay um the world almost lost a young franz liszt to seminary school before he decided to become a pianist uh richard wagner's last opera parsifal is essentially a ritual that weaves christian imagery on a loom of buddhist wisdom mm. late in life uh french composer francis poulenc who's one of my favorites felt called to adapt sacred texts into some of the most haunting choral music of the 20th century modern day minimalists like terry riley arvo part uh, steve reich uh, Alan Hovannis and Henry Gorecki composed music designed to induce trance-like states akin to religious ecstasy. Mm. Um, and that's just a smattering. I mean, the, the intersection where music and mysticism meet is huge. Not every artist. Well, and it, just really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Having, you know, grown up in the church and, you know, we both have our issues with some of those things, but... When but you, I love the music. The mu when, well, <laughs> and, you know, I also love the community of a church and, yeah. and things like that, too. Um and, you know, and the teachings themselves are generally great. It's, it's the, it's the hypocrisy that we really had, yeah, we struggled with. With mine, it was always church leaders who kind of took advantage of it and like, yeah. kind of do as I say, not as I do. Right. And also this is who you vote for. I didn't like that either. Also but, growing up gay, I was like, what, what? Right. God hates me, but I don't, show me in the Bible where it hates me. It, oh, that part in the Old Testament that we as, as right. Christians, um, kind of made a new pact with God whatever that's yeah. a whole other thing I was like exactly. even then I was like um, yeah same thing as a woman you how to feel and you don't seem to know your religion as well as you think you do yes exactly or they you know they get to choose what parts they believe and not and so mm -hmm. beyond that beyond that yeah I know that's a whole discussion that's a whole thing I don't want to dog religion because I know no because I think there's a lot to, of good things yeah. about it I think yeah uh, but having been in those um spaces where you know you go to church and, uh, you know, I went to two separate churches. One was Baptist and one was Lutheran because I like things to be balanced. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, depending, that's like a split personality I right know, there. Very much. It explains that a lot. That great. Uh, You're going to love this guy. Oh, good. Good. So like the Baptist church, it would be these modern takes of songs. Uh -huh, like poppy. Like poppy. And like you we're going to take this 60s classic and make it about like the Moses and the Exodus. Right. Or that? yes, that kind of stuff. Or like I say Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Oh, oh baby. baby, let my people go. Oh. oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, or what was it? Oh, I'm flashing back. I know, I know. Or DC Talk, right? There was that. Oh that my kind god! Of, I it, went to one of their concerts. And, uh, I feel it was, like I did too. It was I probably a free, did too. It was a meet you at the flagpole day at Six Flags, and I was like, I can get a free ticket to Six Flags, and all I got to do is sit through a Christian concert. I'll do okay. that. They weren't bad, and they weren't bad. I tell you, because it's music. I still got swept up in the energy, even right. though it wasn't my music. I know, yeah. That's, and that's so, the power of song. Yeah, and that was a more modern. They did a more modern interpretation, um, but it was also seemed more marketing heavy. Whereas yeah. in the Lutheran Church, it was, and and there was something too. I really I liked kind of the modern stuff, but I also liked the creeds there was something comforting in that and that repetition yeah. and knowing that would always be there and it, it, it was structure to your everyday life well, it was almost spell-like 
yeah in a way so and music has that power exactly and so a lot and of the, the songs though from there were these old songs but it was the congregation singing it and uh uh, not necessarily knowing how to sight read. And so that was always interesting. But so then when you would go to a concert where it would be a whole choir singing these mm -hmm. songs the way that they should be, that the, the way they were written to be sung. Oh, and it was just like goosebumps, you know, hair standing on end. Just, it was, I, it was, it's, it's, it's a whole experience. My algebra teacher when I was in high, high school, she's a great teacher too, but she was this just great, wonderful uh, black lady who was one of the deacons in her church and mm. one of the choir directors as well. And she brought her choir to sing to our school and they, they sang these wonderful classic spirituals. Mm. And I had never, ever seen something like that in my life. And I was yeah. like, Oh my God. Like I hadn't, I can't, it's one of the few times, um, not, well, I shouldn't say one. It was one of the first times I was that moved by a concert. I right. was like, Oh my God, music can do this. Yeah. And it was just, Oh, and I became a huge fan of that kind of, of soul music and spiritual mm, and R&B mm -hmm. and all that after that. And I'm like, oh my, I found Motown. I was like, this mm. is great. Oh my God, why did no one tell me about this? Because yeah. I grew up with um, playing classical and and as modern as my grandfather got was like ragtime and like early jazz mm. stuff, which mm -hmm. is also great. Um, but it's just, I can't help but move to it. Yeah. Every time I hear it, I'm like, man, this shit just gets me. The spirit yeah. takes me. That's right, that's um, right. Incidentally, going back to the whole religious, you know, and composer, like there are a lot of composers have been very moved um, and feel it like the spirit is or God or whatever you want to call it is is speaking through them when they write. One of my favorite 20th century composers was a guy named Olivier Messiaen, who was just this sweet little French guy who was like, you know, cool. Yeah, I love God and very, very, very orthodox uh, Catholic view of the world, but very, he used to go out and he loved bird song. He was obsessed with birds. He's like, they're God's musicians. So he would go out into the woods and transcribe bird song and he'd weave it into his music. But because he was modern, very modern, mm -hmm. like for being this happy sort of, I mean, if he, he, he was kind of like a Buddha, but he was just Catholic. He was like a Catholic Buddha. That, uh, that's the best yeah. way I know how to describe his personality, but his music is some of the most dissonant shit you'd ever hear. And thinking, I mean, it sounds, some of it sounds like outright horror movie music, but to oh, him, yeah. he's like, no, this is existential. This is like, this is ecstatic music yeah. to him because he just, he heard it differently than other people. Oh, wow. And so when I kind of learned how to listen to his music through his own, you know, interpretation, uh, interpretation, I yeah. was like, this is brilliant. And I learned a lot, but that said, okay. not yes. every artist touched by genius follows the way of light. Mm -hmm. For some, music opens up the left-hand path, or the path of witchcraft, right. as it's often called. Or the path of drugs. <laughs> that all, there sometimes it's the same uh, yeah. path. Yeah, and that's usually the 27 club members. Um, <laughs> as it, <laughs> just, just well, saying. this was certainly the case of Peter Warlock. Peter Warlock. Well, born Philip Arnold Heseltine the day before Halloween Heseltine. in 1849, the precocious mm. gadfly destined to take up the arch pen name Peter Warlock came from money. His mother, Bessie Mary Edith, gave birth to him in the Savoy Hotel, which the Heseltines used as their primary London residence. His father, Arnold, died suddenly when Philip was only two. Mm. Bessie wasted no time remarrying to a rich Welshman named Walter Buckley Jones, who transplanted the family to Wales. Mm. Good for Bessie. Uh, oh, Get yeah. it, girl. She was a strong woman. Uh, Heseltine showcased a love of music early on, though he declined serious study. Evidently, though the family had ties to the upper echelons of the art world, Bessie thought a musician's life was beneath her son. He was more or less free to indulge uh, in his passion in private, but mother made it clear he was meant for more respectable things. So the young man forewent his passion and committed to fitting in. Now, fed on a steady Boy. diet of Bible stories and Celtic legends, because this was Wales, right. um, under the watchful eye of his mother, Heseltine grew into a cerebral, if rather sensitive and prickly young man, bound, it seemed, for the civil service. Now, he went to Eton, uh, as many men of his class did, uh, uh, kind of like, a, you know, whatever, in their college days. At Eton, Heseltine was withdrawn. Is Eton a college? Yeah. Okay. Eton, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Eton. It's like <laughs> Eton and the Oxford and like that. Oh, okay. It's, it's that, it's that level. Oxford, it's but... definitely, yeah. I maybe heard of Eton, but just it's not computing right now. Yeah. So, well, that's, yeah, It's it was a real posh finishing uh, school slash kind of pre-college, I think. And it was uh, also a college. This is why um, I haven't heard of it. Yeah. <laughs> this is, we would never have been admitted. No. Well, you're a girl. So right. um, not your... Darn that vagina. <laughs> well, vaginas were still a problem back then, apparently. I don't... <laughs> a problem. They're a problem now. Now, at Eton... <laughs> 
<laughs> at Eton, Heseltine was withdrawn and sullen. He hated what we would now probably call the toxic masculinity of college life, the relentless bullying, the, uh, the militant them versus us mentality, the prevailing idea that culture was somehow for sissies. In one of many letters he was to write during his turbulent lifetime, Heseltine distilled his experience of Eton into, uh, into its essence by calling it a, quote, hearty adolescent bawling of Victorian hymns in an all-male college chapel. <laughs> okay. A closeted bisexual, Philip Heseltine took comfort in music. A performance of Frederick Delius's Liebenstanz had left him relatively unimpressed some years earlier, but when he learned that an uncle knew the composer personally, it kindled an interest in Delius's work bordering on obsession. Philip got mm. his hands on every Delius score he could, writing Mother for the funds to buy them. Later, during the premiere of Songs of Sunset at Queen's Hall, conducted by Sir Thomas Beecham, who was a very towering figure in the music world at the time, he met Delius face to face. The great composer would go on to be a key player in Heseltine's life, encouraging the rash and immature young man to pursue composition at all costs, against the more sage advice of people like Sir Thomas Beecham, who were like, he's too young and immature. Why are right. you telling him to do that? Like, it's fucking stupid. And his mom is like, honey. <sighs> Well, and Mama, he, he kind of told Mom different things about what he was doing. Heseltine's renewed passion for music made life at Eton all the more unbearable. Frustrated beyond endurance and lacking any clear plans for the future, he convinced his mother to let him travel abroad. She reluctantly financed his sabbatical on condition that once he'd sown his wild oats, he'd go back to school, preferably Oxford. Mm. In 1911, he traveled to... That must to... be nice. Look. No shit. All right. Like... I'm going to pay for you to travel the oh, fucking, fucking world. Right. And, but then I want you to go to the most, you know, the, the most expensive elite uh -huh, right. college. Now, yeah. in 1911, he traveled to Cologne uh, to learn German and, more importantly, piano. His lessons, however, were awash. Hesseltine was unfocused, undisciplined, and took instruction poorly. He expanded his knowledge of the music repertoire by attending concerts and operas every chance he got, all on Mother's Dime, of course. Mm -hmm. But when dreams of being a world-class pianist came crashing against the rocky shores of reality, Philip Heseltine decided to exemplify the age-old the age truism concerning failed artists and became a, a critic. Teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Close. Close. Um, <laughs> returning to London in 1915, he wrote his first piece of musical criticism uh, in the, for the musical standard, an article on Arnold Schoenberg. Now, it's worth taking a quick detour to discuss Schoenberg, who was the very superstitious founder of what's called 12-tone music. I'm not going to go into what it means here, but it's extremely dissonant. And Schoenberg essentially created a style of expressionism in music that really captured the horrors of the early part of the 20th century because okay. all these composers were people who'd lived through the Great War. Okay. And so right, music right. was now like, now he, he opened up his music to be horrific sounding and to really make audiences uncomfortable. It was no longer pretty and light or dramatic. It was, it was deeply, deeply unsettling. And some right. of his, some of his music is hard to listen to even today. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, Schoenberg towers over the 20th century. I just need to say really quickly uh -huh. that the teachers thing is a joke. I do not think that teachers are people, failed artists no, or anything no, like that. No, no, of course just, not. It's the big joke. Critics are, big though. Joke. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding, not all of them, but no, in but... Heseltine's case. Uh, so Schoenberg uh, towers over the 20th century alongside fellow artistic luminaries like Picasso and James Joyce. His influence cannot be understated in the music world. He was and is a polarizing figure. His musical language, which he created more or less from scratch, is so impenetrable, so jarring, and yet so expressive, and his celebrity so improbable that Thomas Mann, the famous writer, used Schoenberg as the model for Adrian Leverkun, the protagonist of his book, Faustus. The story, which, as you might understand, um, hint, is a modern-day retelling of the Faust legend, follows the life of a cold, intellectual young man who symbolically sells his soul to the devil in exchange for musical genius. Mm. In the story, on his way to see the premiere of Salome in Austria, which is a great dissonant opera written by Richard Strauss, which was, you know, just rocked the music world to its core in those days. Um, you keep it, saying dissonant. Dissonant, meaning, dissonant. so in, in music, um, I don't want to get into theory because it'll bore the shit out of people, but in music, um, dissonance means like it just, when you hear two notes or more sound together and they don't go together, it's okay. jarring and it kind of makes you wince. Think okay. of that. Okay. And the idea um, 
in, there's two concepts in music. I mean, every piece in music is like you start with a consonance. In other words, a collection of notes that sound really good together. Right. And you travel away from it into more dissonant areas until you get back to a consonance. And so dissonance is part of music, essentially, but it's very controlled. It leads to a, mm. there's tension that needs releasing. And okay. that's why, you know, when you hear a piece of music and it just stops in the middle of it, it feels unfinished. Right. It's because that tension, uh, that harmonic tension has not been relieved. Okay, and gotcha. Schoenberg made music that was basically all dissonance from start to finish. Oh. Like consonants, he's like, let's fuck, fuck, who cares? Consonants. This let's is not a consonant it. century. Let's have dissonance. Yeah. Um, so just think of dissonance as it doesn't necessarily mean jarring, but it, it frequently is. Like on yeah. its own, it's it's kind of like musical sound, it's collections of sounds without context. And so okay. it can seem really disorienting, especially if you've grown up listening to a certain kind of music. You're like, well, that that doesn't sound right. Right. That, it's like that when that they tone sounds off. When it sounds they take like a, a song... cat walking across a piano. Right. Or they'll you know, like, I guess the, the idea of how it feels is whenever you watch, like, some song that then they've shifted a third. Oh, yeah. And then it's like, why is that? Mm -hmm. Ugh. And it has mm -hmm. a totally different meaning and a totally different... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so Schoenberg was all about kind of exploring that. And so he created a language that just kind of threw out this relationship of dissonance and consonance. And he's like, let's just create... Um, instead of using scales, um, which are kind of the building blocks of both harmony and melody... Uh, for for many centuries in music, he's like, let's just 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 throw out the idea of a scale altogether and come up with what's called a row, which is just a random collection of mm. notes that have to be used in that order. Well, because regardless. after in that time period, I'm sure he felt things weren't harmonious, they weren't melodic, they weren't, and he also felt like diatonic music, which is classical music, um, that that style of writing had kind of reached its like he was like what else can we do everything's been done everything's cliche now we've explored right. every possible relationship between sound in in that system of music writing so he's like let's do this okay. so um gotcha. in the book faustus is thomas mann's it's it's a larger allegory about germany kind of selling its soul to the devil via the nazis uh -huh. and so the character of adrian leverkun the composer who's based on schoenberg um, um, at least in just in terms of like how he saw music, not in Schoenberg was Jewish. He had no Nazi sympathies whatsoever. Right. In fact, he fled Nazi Germany to America because of it. But Thomas Mann's like, well, you know, it's not a biography of Schoenberg. I'm just kind of using his relationship and how he kind of destroyed Inspired. music um, and kind of took it apart to put it back together again, which is essentially what he did um, to making it a, a, an allegory about Nazi Germany. And so in the book, Adrian Leverkun, the composer that he's based on, um, is going to go, he's on the way to see Salome in Austria, which is a big deal. And on the way, um, he sneaks off with a prostitute who's racked with syphilis. Now, uh -oh. uninterested in uh, the woman sexually, Adrian sleeps with her, believing the illness will imbue him with supernatural creative powers. Wow. The devil comes to him in a fever dream, declaring that Adrian's insane music will live long after him, giving shape and substance to an insane century. Needless to say, Schoenberg well, wasn't exactly thrilled about the novel's implications. Um, he was, uh, however, devoted to numerology, which mm. informed his dark and difficult work, and it might have even contributed to his death. But oh. that's another story for another episode. Okay. Um, I bring Schoenberg up because of some of the parallels to the story Schoenberg inspired to Peter Warlock's actual life. Okay. So back to Hessel time. Okay. Um, after a summer spent lounging around the British Museum transcribing Eliz Elizabethan music, <laughs> the unemployed Heseltine was given a writing position at the Daily Mail. He specialized in early music. Um, he would go on to write a book about uh, the virtuosic 16th century Italian composer Carlo Giasoldo, best remembered for both his eccentric madrigals and for having murdered his wife. Oh. Heseltine was, in the words of one commentator, fixated on the past. There was at least one contemporary who captivated him, though. Aside from Delius, whose biography he would later write after keeping up a friendly, if somewhat reserved, correspondence, Heseltine felt certain that his friend, Dutch composer Bernard van Deren, was destined for greatness. He'd sing van Deren's praises to anyone who'd listen. Sadly, that wasn't a lot of people. <laughs> Though certainly a competent composer, Van Deren's spell over Heseltine seemed to hinge on something other than musical genius. Perhaps it was his dashing good looks and disarming manner. Perhaps it was his morphine addiction, which <laughs> Heseltine took pity on and frequently bankrolled. Perhaps yeah. it was because Heseltine saw in, uh, in Van Deren the strung out, perpetually broke unknown, a kindred spirit wallowing like himself in artistic obscurity. Because Hold on a second. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, it was coming. Goodness. 
Now, okay. Hesseltine at the time had been trying his hand at composition for years. He'd sent pieces of his own to publishers all over London. Most were dismissed outright. The rest were returned unopened. Frustrated, he lashed out at other critics, essentially telling one in print to shove his head up his ass. Nice. Um, I like it. This didn't help his reputation, though letters to mother assured her all was well and good. Um, she was, after all, holding the purse strings. Um, his life was miserable and he hated her because of he had he wasn't his own man like he yeah. depended on her for everything around this time however Hesseltine discovered and was absolutely enthralled by the writings of Aleister Crowley yay or Crowley some people mm -hmm. say it either way now his personality underwent a profound transformation as a result of delving into Crowley's system of magic known as the lemma Friends who knew him as a moody, delicate little hothouse bloom were stunned to see the sensitive young man suddenly dripping with purpose and self-confidence. He became extroverted, garrulous, at times outright garrulous? combative, talkative, okay. using big words. <laughs> 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 I wrote that and I knew you'd call me on it. I love it. I like um, to learn the word. <laughs> Garrulous. Now, at times, he was even combative. To anyone who asked, he made no bones about dabbling in black magic, what he called a science, mm. insisting he invoked demons as readily as most people would pray to God. Following the occult principles laid out by the wickedest man alive, a nickname Crowley took great delight in, Philip Hesseltine anointed himself Peter Warlock and marched gleefully to the tune of his own drum down the left-hand path. He was Gone. a dick wizard. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Gone. <laughs> Gone. I mean, that's why every guy wants to become a wizard. A really, dick wizard. it's about their dick. Um, I don't know if you know the this. First but my name is the first Dick Wizard. <laughs> the first thing they want to do is change their penis size. Um, <laughs> that's the whole draw. Like the devil just has like the contract is simple. It's just one word: big dick. Big dick. Sign here. Big, big dick. dick I get your soul. Um, here, gone was the clean-shaven, slouching aesthet. Here to stay was the outspoken, bearded roustabout <gasps> who would take the music world by storm. Now, true, if he wanted to publish music without incurring the wrath of artists and tastemakers he'd roasted in print, an alias was wise. But Peter Warlock was more than a nom de plume. He was a fully-fleshed alter ego that utterly consumed Hesseltine. Uh, Art critic it Brian... It was his Sasha Fierce. <laughs> <laughs> But Art. with more devil. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, in pictures of the guy, he looks very satanic. Like, he's oh, yeah. very charming. You're like, oh, yeah, you look like you play Mephistopheles in just every... Like, you, you'd you be in Lucifer. <laughs> he's not a, he's not a bad-looking dude. Um, and the look works for him. I'm like, oh, yeah. okay, yeah. All you, right. That's, that's a, Send me a picture and I'll put it on Even then, Instagram. that was a risky look, but you pulled it off, sir. Yeah. Art critic uh, Brian Sewell, who believes himself to be one of Warlock's illegitimate sons, says his father became a, quote, sexually voracious bisexual sadist with multiple mistresses. If one of his girls became pregnant, as they often did, he simply gave them a fiver to pay for an abortion. Now, Sewell really is Warlock's son. He's not the only one, of course. While carousing with fellow bohemians at London's infamous Café Royale, he met the artist's model Minnie Lucy Channing, dubbed Puma, for her Hellcat temperament. Oh, I like her. Right? The pair struck up a romance that ended in marriage when Minnie became pregnant. Whether the bouncing baby boy named Nigel was the fruit of Warlock's loins is open to dispute. The <laughs> mother of aforementioned Brian Sewell was a woman named Jessica Goldblatt, one of Warlock's many side pieces. Point is, the black magician got around. Yeah. Warlock dove headfirst into hedonism and never came up for air. Wine, women, men, drugs, orgies, obscure rituals involving all all kinds of sinister sacraments, these became his stock. He was living trade. his best life. His songs and <laughs> chamber pieces, which are delicate little miniatures, some less than two minutes in length, glittering with dreamlike harmonies and wistful angelic melodies, these were instantly hailed as masterpieces. Oh, wow. No one gave a goddamn about Philip Heselton. No one could get enough of Peter Warlock. Oh, that's really funny. In 1917. So if it's not working out for you artistically wise, just start fucking around, that's see what happens. In 1917, <laughs> Warlock rented a cottage in a sleepy Cornwall village. The cottage commanded a breathtaking view of the moors. He could stand at his window and take in the rolling fog shrouded fields bordered by craggy hills on which stood gloomy druidic ruins. He could, without leaving the house, quote, see the sun rise at five in the morning and sink into the sea at night. The sky never grows dark, he wrote to a friend. 
The darkness seems rather to come welling out of the earth like a dye, infusing into every shape and form, every twig and every stone, a keen, intense blackness. In another letter to a friend, Warlock maintained that all modern music comes from the Antichrist, oh. and he was proud to be on board. Goodness. He continued, He's a little pot stirred. Mm, he continued to devour Crowley's work, as well as that of W.B. Yeats, the poet who was also an occultist, and a guy named Elphus Levy, who was a famous occultist, and many others, steeping himself in dark rites meant to unleash one's creative potential. And amazingly, it seemed to work. Not only was he enjoying a major success, but on a lark, and this is funny, Warlock entered a Christmas carol writing contest in Cornwall. <laughs> His submission won a handsome payout. The song, Bethlehem Down, still features prominently in British churches throughout the holiday season today. Oh, really? I wonder if any of the parishioners raising <clears throat> their voice in song know the composer was fond of riding his motorcycle through town naked. <laughs> I love, I mean, really love this guy. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> Warlock's time in Cornwall was legendary. If his years there were marked by unbridled debauchery, and they were, they were also enormously productive. Weekdays would see him bent over his piano, tickling the ivories and scribbling on manuscript paper, churning out the pieces for which he was rapidly becoming famous. Weekends would see the cottage swarmed with drunken revelers, occultists, drug pushers, and prostitutes engaged in orgies for which Warlock was rapidly becoming notorious. Puma didn't mind. She and Warlock had long grown cold on each other. When her husband's lifestyle became too much for her, she simply took little Nigel away and seldom looked back. Warlock's celebrity brought him in contact with other bad boys of his day, most notably D.H. Lawrence, the writer. The two initially got on like a house on fire, but grew to hate one another before the friendship was even a year old. Lawrence insisted Warlock, quote, ought to be flushed down a sewer, for he is a simple shit. <laughs> 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 when Warlock and Puma appeared as thinly disguised and none too flattering background characters in Lawrence's Women in Love, Warlock used a copy of toilet paper. <laughs> As the 1920s rolled in, Warlock's popularity waned. Debt collectors hounded him back to Wales, where, humiliated, he took up residence on the family estate, his only option then. Yeah. Here, the Warlock persona faded, and the depression he struggled with all his life came back in full force. Warlock, once again the defeated, stoop-shouldered Philip Heseltine, took to the bottle with reckless abandon. Mm. During this time, he reconnected with a woman named Winifred, about whom we know very little except that Heseltine loved her. She'd skirted the periphery of Warlock's decadent circle for years, never quite taking center stage, but always offering encouragement from the wings, especially when it came to his music. Only after hitting rock bottom did he recognize her as his angel. In copious letters, he refers to Winifred as one of as the one good thing in his otherwise desultory and ridiculous life. Aww. Though depression and anxiety were his constant companions and the bottle never far away, toward the end, Heselton saw a brief resurgence in popularity. His songs and chamber pieces were in demand all across Europe. The public was hungry for new works from their beloved Enfant Terrible. He, <laughs> um, he threw himself into composition with renewed gusto, earning enough money to leave the family home and purchase a flat in Chelsea. In fact, in his last decade, he earned a small fortune, almost a million pounds in today's money. Now, how often he had to avail himself of his dark alter ego to meet a deadline or tap the wellspring of inspiration, we don't know, but he almost certainly did. Heseltine never entirely grew out of his fondness for mayhem. In fact, he still liked to party with his old pal, Van Duren, the Dutch composer, mm. who'd somehow managed to carry on all these years under the yoke of his crippling morphine addiction. Van Duren and his long-suffering wife, perhaps more than anyone, were pleased as punch to see Heseltine come back into money. I bet, yeah. Which is why some think Van Deren had a hand in Heseltine's untimely death. <gasps> in December of 1930, just one week before Christmas, neighbors woke to the sound of Heseltine's beloved black kitten crying outside his door. The smell of coal gas permeated the hall. Uh -oh. When, after several minutes of insistent knocking, Heseltine failed to answer, police were called in. They broke open the bolted door and found a 36-year-old Philip Heselton slumped on the carpet, dead. The gas oven had been on all night. Mm. On a pile of papers strewn across the kitchen table laid a hastily scribbled will, bequeathing everything to Winifred. This was in stark contrast to an earlier version in which Heseltine named Van Deren. As executor. Oh. Heselton's death raises many questions. Did he at last succumb to his lifelong struggle with depression? The fact he put his kitten outside before bolting the door strongly suggests so. Yeah. Was it a horrible accident? Heseltine had been out drinking that evening with Van Duren. Perhaps the, he simply neglected to light the oven after turning it on and drunkenly passed out. 
Sewell, Heselton's illegitimate son, you'll remember, believes Van Deren murdered his father. Perhaps after a night of drunken caterwauling, the two men returned to Heselton's flat. Van Deren spied the new will on the table and in desperation contrived to murder his benefactor before it could be notarized. How then he managed to engage the deadbolt as he left remains to be seen. Mm. But whether suicide, murder, or tragic accident, Heselton's death, and by extension the death of Peter Warlock, seemed to some... Uh, a fitting end to a sinister man with split personality. As far as they're concerned, it was the price of dabbling in black magic. Mm. Mm. And that wow. is <clears throat> the very, that's a very small version of the life of Peter Warlock. Wow. Yeah, 36. Never heard of him before. Yeah. His, uh, it's funny. I hadn't either. And I thought I was pretty up on 20th century composers, but like, if you look him up, he's like, yeah, he's, he's everywhere. Oh. You see songs of his, um, and they're beautiful. Like yeah. they're lovely works. You can hear them and be like, this is written by a guy that basically was into black magic. You'd never know. You'd never know. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, because there are some of them and some of them are fun and witty and others are just really beautiful and kind of haunting, but they don't, you know, you, when, when I, I guess you don't imagine when you're hearing it that he'd fucked his way to that song. <laughs> fucked a lot of people <laughs> uh, to that, men and women, and probably animals. Who knows? Yeah, you, know, you never know. Knows, but yeah, Oof. and it just it seems, and it also seems like ma black magic worked because yeah. I mean, just he went from a nobody to a somebody. Yeah, that made a million dollars on his Oof. music. The yeah. guy that couldn't even get through piano lessons when he well, was younger. And there's something to be said, though, that, you know, with the magic helping him, it could not have helped him had he not been from money. Oh, yeah, probably you not. You know, I yeah, know. so know. doubtful. Based. Yeah. Not long, I failed to mention that part, but not long after he started delving into the occult, his mother died. And, oh. and so then he was kind of free from her and had a stipend of his own that he didn't have to, like, beg mommy for. Right. So that did free him up a little bit. But was it just a happy coincidence or did he somehow be like, hey, if my mom could die, that'd be great. Right. Thanks, devil. Or yeah. God's elder God. What, whoever, whoever. Whoever. Yeah. I dabbled. I dabbled myself you when I was dabble. young. Yeah, and I mean, just, I'm just saying, here I you am. You were a goth. You had to. <laughs> yeah, I was obligated was required. to. <laughs> I was more of a, of a, of a grunge person. Mm, mm. But that's because everybody was. I was in the the middle if you weren't goth you were grunge there was like everybody yeah. if were, you didn't have a plaid like plaid flannel flannel tied flannel. around your waist then you were goth <laughs> that was it there was no in between yeah well you could be you could still be a jock or a roper remember the ropers the country people country people country the, the, yeah. the guys that they, they were usually like really really into the ag scene and yes. they, they wore like the like the Levi's, the bid belt buckles. And they had a plaid shirt too, right. but it was buttoned up. But it was buttoned up, mm -hmm. yes, and had pockets. And often cowboy with boots snaps. and hat. Yeah. yeah, that's true. There's a lot of those in my We called them school. ropers. What do we call just We just called them ropers. I'm not sure why. Oh. Probably because they rodeo roping. I don't know. Maybe. Hmm. Either way, that was yeah. a great story. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I just, I really felt I wanted to tell the story of Peter Warren. I love it. Well, uh, my story is also something I had not heard before, which is surprising to me because I feel like our uh, British listeners are going to be like, you didn't fucking know about this shit. Ooh. So um, quick break. And when we come back, the Pendle Witch Trial. Yes. Okay. So. Okay. Tell me. Learn the me. The Pendle Witch Trials. Ooh, I can't uh, wait. So these are, okay, my sources. Wikipedia. The article, Cunning Woman, Mother Demdike and Her Legacy by... Mary Sherratt on rendingtheveil.com, Natasha Sheldon on historycollection.co, and the documentary, The Pendle Witch Child. It's a witchcraft documentary from Timeline World History Documentaries, and it is available on YouTube. Oh. It's Ooh. great. Okay. Yeah. Nice. A lot of good sources, Jane. Yes. So I dove in and could not come back out. <laughs> You're still there. I'm still there. Oh, literally. Oh. Okay. So, in the east of Lancashire, Len Len Lancashire? Lancashire? Lancashire. I've always right. heard it, Lancashire. 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 But then, it, yeah, Lancashire. That's what I was thinking. Okay, yeah, good. I think so. Um, I'm sure someone will In the east of Lancashire, England, is Pendle Hill. It's a large, isolated hill about an hour north of Manchester and an hour east of Blackpool, which is on the coast of the Irish Sea. Mm. So this is the location. I can picture it already. Uh -huh. In 1612, 12 people who lived together on this hill were charged, which is not entirely true, 12 people who, uh, and 
a, including a family who lived together on this hill, and they lived at the foot of the hill, were charged with witchcraft. The subsequent trials, it's hard to say together, subsequent trials. <laughs> he still didn't do it. The subsequent trials. There we go. Would become You're Samuel. You're <laughs> uh, would become some of the most famous witch trials in English history, as well as some of the best recorded of the entire 17th century. Ooh. And neither one of us have fucking heard How of it. How the fuck did this? I don't know. That's because I'm know. American and we think Salem is everything. I, mean, I know. It's, it's a, Salem is pretty it's important. It's the largest. It's the largest sure. that, yeah. And, but, but still, like, this, also was going on. Witch hunting were going on in England for centuries. Yes. This trial changed everything Ooh. with trials and stuff like that, So, which we'll get into. Eventually. Mm. And um, so the haunting is Pendle Hill, the surrounding area, some of the villages and, and cities nearby. Yeah. There's a lot of haunting. But before we can get into the haunting, we have to get into the history. Of course. Every haunting has a history. That's right. The trials were actually unusual for England at the time. These trials, which ended in the hanging of 10 in Lancaster and one in York, accounted for more than 2% of the total individuals killed during the English witch trials that started up through the early 15th and 18th centuries. Hmm. Over 2%. Damn. In total, there were Damn. fewer than 500 people put to death as witches in England in that 300-year time period. Which... I mean, it's... Yeah. Most people assume it's quite a bit more than 500. I would, I would have, but still. Yeah, but it, it was really 500. 500 is not a good number, but right. it's better than 1,000. Yes, and the trials were far greater than that. But it, it, most of the time, they were acquitted. It wasn't like you got uh, tried and immediately you were a witch and you were put to death. Interesting, that, okay. That is not actually what was happening. All right. Okay. I think that's the impression most people get. Yes. Because of Salem. Yes, it's it's not accurate. And some people even say 75% of the people who were accused were acquitted. Oh. Uh, so. And well, there, that's and, encouraging. I know, I know. It's for a multi multitude of reasons. But what makes these trials truly stand out is that was documented in an official publication, which is the book, that is the title, The Wonderful Discovery of Witches in the County of Lancaster. It by sounds the, so light. I know, it does. It's like the wonderful discovery. It's not. It's, it's not. Terrible. They meant wonderful as in like terrible. Yes. And that was written by the clerk of the court, Thomas Potts, who used his notes taken directly from the trials. That has got to be one of the most British names. Thomas Potts. Thomas Potts. Yes. And Mr. Potts. Realistically, it's not exactly accurate he did have a flair for the drama so on some of the confessions and stuff like that he acted as though they read it and that it was said in court but it wasn't it might have been read in court but it was not t you know testified in are court. you saying the cell copies of his book yes he dramatized he certain did dramatize. things and yes. maybe mischaracterized certain mm -hmm. things he that did. happen wow Absolutely. That's been going he on for a long the truth time. A bit. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So the story starts with a teen girl named Alison Device. Devis, really, is how you say it. Um, Devis, what a great, that's a great Devis. name. It looks like Device, though. She lived with her grandmother, brother, mother, and half sister in what was known as. For a moment, I thought that was all the same person. No. <laughs> I was like, wow, no, no. that's a messed up family. Yeah, no. Grandmother, mother, brother, and half-sister. Okay. And what was known as Malkin Tower at the base of the hill in what was then the Forest of Pendle. Now, hmm. when people hear tower, they tend to imagine, a, you know. A Rapunzel. Or, a tower. Or, yeah, know, like an like actual tower. Saruman. And for people who haven't been over there, there are just random towers just mm -hmm. standing up yep. from whenever. Um, but it's actually more likely this tower was just a small cottage. The Devises were poverty-stricken, and they were known beggars, so they couldn't afford anything ornate. When you consider that Malkin was a term for shabby or poor woman, an old cat, and some accounts just shit, Malkin Tower was most likely a sarcastic name given to the Devises' home by neighbors and villagers nearby. Welcome to Shit Tower. Yep. Pretty much. <laughs> Allison's grandmother was Elizabeth Southerns, a.k.a. Mother Demdike, a.k.a. Old Demdike. Demdike is a name. I know. She was I'm called sorry. Old Demdike. I know. I just, I just, I keep reminding myself. Grow up, Tatum. Grow yeah, up. I know. I know. I was <laughs> I like, how? the same thing back then. Because I have to say dyke a whole bunch of times. <laughs> ah! And I've got to get through it. And it was her alias, like also known as Demdike. Name. Yeah, so at the time, Demdike, it was a name derived from demon woman. 
Oh. Yes. Oh. In fact, old Demdike was known as a cunning woman, which was a wise woman who worked as a healer and magical uh, practitioner in the area. Okay. They usually worked for poor families, healing people and animals. They did some forms of social work and helped with legal matters. They were like police. They, if you had it makes it, sense. I mean, yeah. because people, especially if you were poverty stricken, like you couldn't pay the money to go and get like an official magistrate to help you or to pay to church or something. You right. couldn't pay the expense to go travel. Exactly. So you went to the old witch woman. Yeah. Yeah. The cunning woman. Mm -hmm. So the, like, if somebody lost something or they couldn't find their item, something had been stolen, they would go to her. She would do some divination, divination, divination. and say, okay, these are the people that stole. Ooh. This is where your stuff is, right? The problem with that is, um, although cunning women generally use their magic for good, if their clients grew upset with them, or let's say they accused someone who was like, nah, -uh, I didn't steal that shit you're a witch, it became very dangerous very quickly. Mm. So even in the Ugh. 16th and 17th centuries, it became dangerous when spells, witchcraft, and sorcery were fairly, still fairly mainstream. Yeah. People believed in magic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the lines between that old Celtic fairy kind of land worship and yeah. Catholicism was still very oh, yeah. mixed up, you know? Yeah, especially the more rural you got. People exactly. were like, oh, yeah, we've heard of Jesus. He seems really cool. Yes. But I'm going to go and, you know, leave food out for the wee folk because right. my garden exactly. needs growing. And you it's, know? it's very much, you know, like, especially being in Texas, they're, you know, we're very close to Mexico. We have uh -huh. a lot of influence of Mexican people in our culture. And, uh, you know, they the evil eye, you know, oh, they yeah. do the yeah. egg thing that rub it on you. So it's a combination yeah. of these old witchy kind of thing because well, the church would come into any area and be like all right you guys can still basically do all the shit you've been doing because we know you're, you're not going to stop but now just say it's this right just like give it a new name right like, say it's for or, jesus yeah add some or stuff whatever. into it add and so into it, which yes. is how which is why most churches were built on old pagan sites mm -hmm. and most uh not most but a lot of saints at least were uh, were like updated versions of pagan deities right of local pagan deities. well and like, the okay. dates are very similar mm -hmm. to pagan mm -hmm. day yes yeah. so um but everybody <clears throat> for the most part believed in magic mm -hmm. it was just accepted it was a part of of life and so in her 80s at the time old dumb dyke had been a cunning woman for at least 50 years she was and to be in your 80s woman. In that in time period, 16, people were like, this bitch, she's made a deal with somebody. I know. I know, right? Demdike taught her daughter, Elizabeth Devis, magic as well. And of course, those teachings were continued in their family with Elizabeth's children. Allison and her younger 14-year-old brother, James, whose father, Elizabeth's husband, had died about 11 years earlier. Okay. Allison's sister, Janet, was 10, and no one but Elizabeth knew who her father was. She was the youngest, a half-sibling, and illegitimate. Mm. there's a chance she was treated differently mm. than the other children. Yeah, maybe. But we don't know. It's kind of, you know, in poverty is stricken areas, there is less pressure on those kinds of things because society... Because there are no ranks to rise through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. like we're all here. Fucking rock bottom, we're all family. Yes, exactly. And there were no... By the time Janet came along, there were no men in the family that was just mm. the 14 year old boy so mm. wow. um on march 21st 1612 allison was walking on the road through the forest when she came across john law who was a peddler from halifax she asked him to buy some of his pens. she asked to buy some of his pens but he refused they're like straight pens right? oh yeah yeah <clears throat> Straight pins at the time were metal, handcrafted, and relatively expensive, but they were frequently needed for magical purposes, such as in healing, particular, like particularly if they were treating warts, mm. divin divination, and for love magic. Oh. She claims she wanted to purchase the pins, but Law's son Abraham later said she was actually begging for them. We don't know for sure. But it seems likely she was begging for them because she was, again, a known beggar. Mm, they mm, were very mm. poor. They were poor. Could and pens they were expensive. To like... get those? Yeah. It seems <clears throat> most likely that's the case. Mm, mm. Either way, John Law refused to accommodate her request. Eliza, Eliza. 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 I like Eliza. Eliza? Eliza. I, I, I really don't know. Oh, Allison. I spelled it wrong. Oh. It's like, <laughs> this is why I stopped. Oh, <laughs> Allison. It's Allison with a Z. 
Okay. Sometimes you see it as Allison, but it's Allison. Okay. Okay. Allison responded by cursing John, and moments later, he collapsed on the ground. Ooh, she was good. He somehow managed to regain his feet and made his way to a nearby inn where his condition worsened. Allison knew it was her fault because she had cursed him and she was devastated by her actions. So a few days later, her guilt led Allison to his bedside where she confessed and asked him to forgive her, which he did at the time. Aww. Enter the Justice of the Peace for Pendle, uh, oh. Roger Noel. <laughs> okay, no, wait. Noel. First, let's not do that. <laughs> Pause on Noel. First, we need to go through a little English history really quickly. Okay. So we can catch up on the political climate of the time. Ooh. Specifically with King James I, who was king at the time. Mm-hmm. He was the great-great-grandson of Henry VIII, who we know created the Church of England to escape the Catholic rules on divorce and murdering your wives. <laughs> After Henry, Edward the fourth became king at the ripe old age of nine. Mm-hmm. When he became terminally ill at 15, he and his council slash actual rulers of the country right. decided that his first cousin, Lady Jane Grey, would become the new mon- mon- monarch, I can say it, in order to maintain the Church of England as the rightful faith. Yep. Now, Mary had been uh, declared illegitimate by the Church of England. Elizabeth had been, who was, uh, Jane, er, so Mary was Catherine's and Henry's daughter, first yes. the eldest. Yes. Then there was Elizabeth, who was Anne Boleyn and Henry's yes. daughter. She was declared illegitimate by both the Catholic Church and the Church of yeah. England. So, yeah. No love for her. No, they got skipped mm. and moved on to Lady Jane Grey, who was a descendant of Henry's older sister. Mm. Right. Mm. That's why she was next in line. Well, uh, <laughs> Mary was, Jane is known as the nine days, que- nine days queen. <laughs> the nine days queen. The nine days, nine days queen. Oh. <laughs> because Mary was having none of that shit. <laughs> she rode into London with Elizabeth and was like, fuck this noise. I'm taking over. By then, shortly after <laughs> Uh, she had shortly after uh, Jane Grey had taken over, uh-huh. p- her popularity waned. People wanted Mary. Oh. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Jane never even made it to her coronation. <laughs> Mary came in and took the throne. Um, Jane actually didn't even make it a full year afterwards because Mary ended up executing Jane and her husband. Yep, yep. Mary was queen for five whole years. Oof. But boy, did she make those five years count. Uh-huh. She aggressively made the country Jeez. Catholic again, and that is how she earned the nickname Bloody Mary. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. When Mary died, her half-sister, Henry's second child, Elizabeth, succeeded and reigned for 44 years. Elizabeth took the country back to Protestantism, albeit not as aggressively, but she still managed to kill a ton of people at the same time. She actually killed more people than Mary. Well, she, but there were forty, you know, four decades. Four, yeah, four decades, she and then there time. were uprisings yeah. by certain Catholics yep. that she was yep. like, just just kill them all, and so I don't have to deal with it. Yep. Whereas, yep. and also, you know, if there were some of the Jesuit priests that were around mm-hmm. um, that were continuing to disobey or whatever. Well, she had she had to deal with a lot of yeah. shit from the Catholic Church. Yes. Um, yes. I've seen the movie. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> and and Mary had done a lot of exiling people. She killed 200 and something, between mm-hmm. two and 300 people. Yeah. Um, but because of the uprisings, especially in Scotland and some other areas, yeah. Elizabeth yeah, yeah, killed yeah. hundreds. Yeah. Multiple, like seven, 800 people, something like that. A lot of it is because <clears> her <throat> fucking sister wouldn't have killed more people. Yeah, <laughs> so that's true. Exiled them. And then once Elizabeth came queen, they're like, let's go back. Yeah. And kill Elizabeth because she's weak. Right. And they were and they oh, were so very wrong. so fucking wrong. That's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, then she died. James the first succeeded. Mm. His father had also been murdered, most likely by a man his mother later married. Mm-hmm. Oh, and his mother had been Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, the one whose head Elizabeth had ordered chopped off. Uh, it's the one that took like three. Yeah. Hits to, yeah. Yeah. In 1612, 
James had only been on the throne for nine years, and he was, to put it mildly, nervous as fuck. <laughs> the last thing he wanted was Catholics to take over again. Right. James was raised as a Protestant, so he was raised to fear magic and witches. Yep. The, the whole King James Bible that uh -huh. uh, misquoted, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Yep. That was commissioned by this King James. You know, like let's just let's just slip that into the Bible real quick so people hate witches. Right. And it doesn't fit in that area. It, it just stands out. It's very it's strange. There. It's like the Most... middle of a parable. It's like blah 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 blah. And he ate us of the fruit and multiplied and by the way, witches, bad news, killed them all. Yeah. Anyway, so back to the story. Like, yeah. it's so fucking weird. It's such a detour. It is. And most likely, um, the word that they the Hebrew word that they were using, mm -hmm. it could have meant like an herbalist, meaning a poisoner. Yeah. But it also could have just been a an evil person. Yeah. So yeah. which has a the 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 history of the word witch and its mm -hmm. uses is fascinating. Yeah. We'll have to do a little so special most, on that sometime. Yeah. It seems uh that this was what it seems to me, my assumption is that James was like, Hey, we're gonna do this new telling of the Bible so that everybody's on the same page. And his intentions were good, so that everybody had one Bible to go off of, right? In English. Yes, mm -hmm. in English. Nobody had any questions. Yeah. But I bet he told those people, put you got to put find somewhere in there to put that witches are evil. And all of these other things that I don't like are evil. Yeah. And well, so, and, and it's important <clears> to remember, too, that James was a total puppet of his cabinet. Like, he mm -hmm. was just this fucking nervous ruler. It was like, sure, whatever. And the cabinet just, he would say, well, no, we're going to do this. And the cabinet would be like, no, we're not. Yeah. You're right. We're not going to do that. Yeah. So he was he was not a very effective ruler. No. Elizabeth, at least, you know, his 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 sister was very, like, you know... Uh, or not sister, whatever relationship is there. Aunt. Um, Elizabeth was very Cousin, much in control like of her cabinet at any given time. But yeah. James was just, he was just a fucking weakling. He was spineless. Well, and, and a lot of that too is, you know, like, because the reason he succeeded, she never named a successor. He kind of cozied up to her on the advice of one of her advisors. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, if you want to be king, you, uh, you should and probably they were like, hey, if you're king, so I'm set was, for life. So exactly. go, go be king, go James, be king. and you can wear all the cool shit and whoop, smile and wave. It's what That's you're right. paid for. Right. And then we'll we'll uh, just divvy up the, we'll carve up the country a little finer right. among ourselves. And the Thank funny thing much. is, because there was very, they didn't have to change religion again. The, you know, there weren't any wars. It was mostly peaceful. Mm -hmm. The people at the time loved James because their lives were easier for yeah. the most part with him yeah. being king. Um, and so, uh, what was I going to say? So anyway, it was just in the, Elizabeth was very focused on appearance. Yes. James was not. He was like, I just want to go hunting, though. And Elizabeth <laughs> was not like that. And she wasn't like that because of Philip, which was Mary's first husband and yep. her only husband. And and anyway, that yeah. is a whole, I mean, we don't have yeah. time to go through that. Okay, I know, right? so, <clears throat> oh, royal on top intrigue. Of, I know, I know. On top I of all of this. I have such a boner right now. I know, I know. know that. <laughs> so on top of all of this, that whole Guy Fox gunpowder plot to blow mm -hmm. up Parliament and assassinate the king happened to King James. So he was, to put it in modern troll times, triggered. <laughs> and Catholicism was conflated with witchcraft at the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lancaster, in particular, had a reputation for being wild and untamed. It was considered full of troublemakers, subversives, and Catholics. It was like the perfect magical storm was being, was brewing. It was brewing. It was brewing. There's a storm of brewing. Yes. Um, so now, enter, and two, I don't know if I said this, but, um, oh, this part, this is a big part. Um, <laughs> he was obsessed with the occult as well. And until his reign, which persecutions had been relatively rare in England compared with Scotland and continental Europe, but well, yeah, I mean, one of Elizabeth's like chief advisors was Dr. John D, the occultist. Yeah, yeah. he had a position as like the she, royal as a royal advisor. She was an she had an astrologer determine what day she should get, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, coronated. Mm -hmm. So, well, James had gone to some witch trials when he went to Denmark, I think, to mm. get, meet his wife, okay. and um, was became fascinated, and so he wrote the book Demonology. In 1597, he wrote it himself, <laughs> and it presented the idea of a vast conspiracy of satanic witches threatening to undermine the nation. The Scottish play written by Shakespeare uh -huh. 
It presents the very first depiction of a witch's coven in English drama that was written in James I honor. Yeah. So. Yeah. This is this is the mindset. Okay, now we can go back. Okay, this is fascinating to me. To Roger Newell, the resident justice of the peace and zealot. He felt in order to be successful in his career, he needed to identify nonconformists, which could be either Catholics or witches, and bring them to justice. <laughs> oh, God. John Law, the peddler, initially uh -huh. forgave Allison, but his son did not. Abraham Law reported Allison's confession to Noel. Noel subsequently summoned Allison, her mother Elizabeth, and her brother John to appear for interrogation on March 30th. Allison confessed that she had sold her soul to the devil and that she had told him to lame John Law via her, um, an animal, a dog. I think it was, she had a dog that was familiar. Her familiar. Like yeah, I think it was, I think it was a dog. Um, after he had called her a thief, she was like, all right. Curse him. Revenge. <laughs> we now know, based on information on Law's illness, that he most likely had a stroke. Half of his face was numb. Yeah. He couldn't walk anymore. He had trouble talking. It was. It seemed very much like a stroke. Mm. Uh, but they were like, witches! Yep, exactly. But, well, it doesn't mean that Allison's curse didn't work. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know? maybe that's just... Um, um, and, they, and you think about it, too. They have a confrontation, and she curses him to his face. So he's believes in magic right he's stressed yeah. he's stressed, stressed from this out. confrontation it's got a blood a clot somewhere and it just you know, there you gets go. free and then there you go mm. that's all you needed so in a way it did work yeah so who's I to mean, say if it was the curse or if it was just the situation the important thing is he forgave her yes and throughout this whole story it's important to realize allison thought it blames herself blamed herself the entire time mm. she knew she had done it uh so, Al yeah, her brother James stated at this interrogation questioning mm. that his sister had also confessed to bewitching a local child. Elizabeth was like, nah, -uh. the only thing she said was that her mother, old Demdike, might have a mark, meaning a mark on her body that some might see as having been left by the devil after he had sucked her blood. Uh, this yeah. is that whole third nipple. Thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because that's what the third nipple was. It was where the devil sucked that's your blood. The devil's teat. That's right. Now, there was another cunning woman in the area by the name of Anne Whittle, aka Old Chaddix. She was also <laughs> in her 80s. God damn. I know. Two women in their 80s. And the matriarch of her family. Noel questioned Allison about them, and Allison accused Chaddix of murdering four men by witchcraft and of killing. Her father, Allison's father, John Devis, who had died in 1601. Mm. She claimed that her father had been so frightened of old Chaddix that he had agreed to give her eight pounds, or 3.6 kilograms, of oatmeal <laughs> every year in return for her promise not to hurt his family. The meal was handed over annually until the year before John's death. On yeah. his deathbed, John claimed that his sickness had been caused by Chaddix because they had not paid for protection. Also happening in 1601, a member of Chaddix's family broke into Malkin Tower and stole goods worth about a pound. So it's like 150 American dollars yeah. today. Uh, that started to, the bad blood between the Chaddixes and the Devises. It was like the Hatfields and McCoys, but with women and magic. Ooh, I love it. Yeah, so. It's on, like the Hatfields and the McCoys, but the hats were pointy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. On April 2nd, 1612, Old Demdike, Old Chaddix, and Chaddix's daughter, Anne Redfern, were summoned to appear before Noel for more questioning slash interrogation. Mm. Demdike and Chaddix were blind because... 17th century 80s is like 3,000 years old today. Oh my god, yeah. Yeah. Uh, both women... They didn't even have eyes anymore. I know. They, they, were just, just... They, just, just, they just wrinkled out of their head. Exactly. Uh, both women confessed to Noel. Demdike claimed that she had given her soul to the devil 20 years earlier, and Chaddix said she had given her soul to a thing like a Christian man on his promise that she would not lack anything and would get re uh, any revenge she desired. Anne Redfern did not confess to anything, but Demdike said that she had seen Anne making clay figures. The clay figures were basically clay voodoo dolls, right? Yeah. They used puppets. Yeah. They were required to have human hair and teeth to work, though, <laughs> and those items were allegedly collected from bodies buried in the local graveyard. We used to make those for art class. You would go dig up bodies <laughs> and... It was a small town. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it seems that these 
clay dolls might have actually been made and that the graves were actually dug up to get these teeth and hair. I mean, whether or not, I mean, if we set aside the question of whether or not witchcraft is real and actually works, because that is a different, uh, that is That's a, different a different question beyond the scope of this podcast. discussion. Yeah. Um, the thing is like those practices were shit people believed in and yes. did yeah. whether or not they actually did what they claimed to, right. whether they were effective or not is a whole other thing. But people did like dig up bodies and use hair and make that mm -hmm. stuff because they're like, yeah, it did work. I mean, yep. it was, it was part of the thing. I mean, there witchcraft was an established sort of uh, subculture mm -hmm. back then thriving. So people, it's like, which is, may or may not have existed, but people who believe themselves to be witches and who followed those practices mm -hmm. have always existed. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and some, according to some experts, they do represent kind of a vast network of kind of this underground counterculture mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe were interested in having a hand in politics or mm -hmm. changing things because, I mean, what's the fun of having a vast conspiracy if you're just going to sit around right. making dolls? Yeah, exactly. So, um, Margaret... Crook, another witness seen by Noel that day, claimed that her brother had fallen sick and died after having a disagreement with Redfern and that he had frequently blamed her for his illness. Noel thought being Witchfinder General was fun, so he decided <laughs> to prosecute Allison, her grandmother, Old Demdike, Old Chaddix, and her daughter, Anne Redfern, for harming people with witchcraft. This was his chance, right? He's like, to, this is my moment. This is his moment. He marched them literally to Lancaster Castle to await trial at the Assize Court. Mm. Uh, Assizes were traveling courts, so they didn't okay. have a courthouse in that county mm. at the time. So they had these traveling courthouses that would go twice a year mm. okay. from county to county. And they would just travel and hear whatever trials needed to be heard. Yeah. So uh, the next one was going to be in August. So after walking 30 to 40 miles to the castle, because he made them walk, even though they were 80, <sighs> surprised they both survived that, uh, they were handed over to a sadistic jailer, Thomas Covell, who chained them to a ring in the floor of the bottom of the well tower and kept them in darkness. All of that, they then had to wait four and a half fucking months. Oh, my God. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Yeah, through the summer. Fun. So poor people have just never had much luck in the legal no. system anywhere in the world. No, and that becomes more prevalent in a little bit. So oh, fucking shit. It probably would have ended with the four women, except on April 10th, the Friday following the arrests, Elizabeth threw a gathering, a meeting really, at Malkin Tower. James Devis stole a sheep, and friends and others sympathetic to the family attended to show their support. The problem was it was Good Friday and all the good God-fearing folk were in church. Ooh. Earlier that year, every justice of the peace in Lancashire, because it had this really bad um, reputation and also they believed some of the people involved with Guy Fawkes' plot mm -hmm, had mm -hmm. fled to Lancashire. Yeah. So what they, uh, they were supposed to compile a list of recusants in the area. So those are the people who refused to attend the English church and to take communion, which was a criminal offense at the time. Yep. They thought if they did that, they could find those people and help. They're trying know. to basically smoke them out. Yeah, smoke them out. And then also, you know, if other Catholics were going down with them, okay. Yeah. Of course, Oof. some asshole ratted out the gathering to Roger Newell, Noel, and he descended on the party. By the time he arrived, most of the people were gone, but apparently Elizabeth was like, well, let me tell you who all was here, motherfucker. That's a direct oh. quote, I'm sure. <laughs> Everyone present. I want it to be so know, badly. Let me tell you who was here. Uh... Okay, so everyone present was arrested, and those implicated were arrested soon afterwards. Elizabeth Devis, John Devis, Jane Bullcock, Jane's son, John Bullcock, Catherine Hewitt, Alice Gray, Janet Preston, and Alice Nutter. This is the part where I want to point out that Nutter and Devis, or Device, are both witches in Neil Gaiman's and Terry Pratchett's. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so those names. Oh, I thought they sounded familiar. It's Anathema, familiar. Device, and... Yeah. Um, Agnes Nutter. Yeah. 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 Oh. So I was like, how did I not know this story? <laughs> okay. So Janet Devis, the 10 mm -hmm. year old, she was not taken to Lancaster Castle. She was, or 
Yeah, she wasn't taken to the castle. She was most likely taken in as a ward of Roger, Roger Noel, the same man who was going to put on a show to make sure the trial was noticed. Mm. Go figure, it would be Janet's testimony that wound up getting her entire family sentenced to death. Oh, God damn. Yeah, so Janet Preston, who was a different Janet, mm-hmm. Janet, it's like Janet, but Janet. Damn it, Janet. She's like Jenny. It's like popular, like Jenny. So, um, she was accused of being at the party. Uh, she was tried at the York Assizes since she lived. It looks like ass sizes. So ass sizes. Ass sizes. Um, <laughs> she lived. So they go to judge your uh, your ass size. Right. She lived in Yorkshire, which is weird for her to have traveled like sixty miles. Yeah. To go to this meeting. It's quite a journey back then. Already accused and actually acquitted of murdering a child by witchcraft in 1611 and murdering a local landowner, Thomas Lister, connection, of Westby Hall in April of 1612. Hmm. Okay. However, on July 27th, she was tried and convicted of mur- murdering Thomas Lister again. Hmm. Uh, according to a statement made by Noel to James Devis on the 27th of April, Janet had attended the Malkin Tower meetup to seek help with Lister's murder. Here's the funny thing. Okay, well, this isn't funny. Okay, she was sentenced to death by hanging and executed on July 29th. Okay. Okay, here's the funny thing, which is also not funny. (laughs) It's assumed she was attached to this list because of a longstanding grudge held against her by prosecutor Thomas Lister Jr. Uh, Janet had worked for Lister's father, Thomas Lister, the man she was accused of killing, mm -hmm. and had possibly been his mistress. Daddy favored Janet over his son. So when Thomas died, his son accused Janet of killing him with witchcraft. Oh, damn. He was also the prosecutor. Oh, fuck. However, he didn't have any any evidence at the time, so that trial, she was acquitted. Mm. But he did have a friend named Roger Noel. Of course. And John Devis's confession and testimony put Janet back on the dock for his father's murder. God damn. Double jeopardy was not a thing. Back no, then. no. Here's the crazy shit. He said she was at, John said she was at the meeting to, to get help with Lister's murder. Mm-hmm. The list, the murder, she had already been acquitted of that murder by the time the meeting happened. The, so. The, <sighs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But this is back in the day when they're like, well, just people didn't keep track of timelines. Right, exactly. They're like, well, the public story is this happened. And, and there's like, more what? to it than that, which I'll get into in a second. <sighs> so the Lancaster Assizes took place. August 18th through 19th. Hmm. I've I've done it again. I've randomly researched a case that was within days of its anniversary. <laughs> so <laughs> by the time oh, I don't know how I do it. Da, da, da. So when this episode airs, it will be 407 years and eight days. Damn. Ago. Damn. Yeah. Four oh four hundred was that four hundred and eight days? No, wait, wait, how four hundred and seven years. Four hundred and seven years and eight and eight days. And eight days. Damn. Yeah. Uh, I know. You. It's so weird. It's, it's so like they're weird. reaching out to us. I guess going, so. It's time to tell our story. Yeah, I guess Ooh. so. So, damn. Everyone else was tried in Lancaster. Mm-hmm. Well, everyone except for old Demdike. She did not survive prison and passed oh. away during the wait. Keep in mind, although 12 people were being held or 13 people were being held from the Lancaster Witch Station situation, sorry, um, another three women. From the village of Sam Samlesbury, Samlesbury, <laughs> how's it spelled? S A M L E S B U R Y, Samlesbury, Samles, Samlesbury, Samlesbury. That one, Samlesbury, uh, Samlesbury, Samlesbury. <laughs> um, they were being ass sized, right? It, it was the same, but and... less burials, <laughs> which is true. Um, they were being tried for witchcraft as well. All of them were kept in one cell, which was probably about 20 feet by 12 feet. Man, it's so stupid. Like, it's just stupid. If you believe they're actually witches and that they get together to perform their dark magic. Right. And that they, they're they empowered by being together. Why the fuck would you chain them together? Like, yeah. it's just, it's not, it's just, so, it like tells me 
right off the bat that these people, like the prosecutors, don't fucking believe in witches. They yeah. just see their chance to uh-huh. like, let's fuck these people it's up. It's like a Sexaholics like Anonymous meeting. <laughs> it's a terrible idea. It's terrible, yeah. So it's amazing old Demdike was the only one who died considering all of those, mm. the, the situation. And it was through the summer. Mm. Oh. Right by the ocean. Uh, old Demdike's confession was included in the wonderful discovery of witches in the county of Lancaster. She said about 20 years before, she was on her way home when she was approached by a spirit or devil in the shape of a boy, one half of his coat brown, the other black. He asked her to stop and told her that if she gave him her soul, she could have anything she requested. She then demanded his name and he answered, Tib. She was like, okay, let's do it. For five or six years after that, he would meet her at dawn asking her what she wanted. She always replied that she wanted nothing. But then, after those years, Tib appeared to her in the likeness of a brown dog who crawled on her knee and drank blood from her armpit. Her, her child was in her lap at the time, and she was sleeping. So she woke up and was like, Jesus, save my baby. But she did not ask for Jesus to save herself. And all of that shit made her go stark raving mad for like eight weeks. Wow. Then, now remember, this is her confession during questioning. It's an 80-year-old woman. Yeah being questioned, interrogated, really. And knowing her daughter, her granddaughter, or her granddaughter and her grandson, I think, are all there, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Then she and her daughter were insulted by Richard Baldwin. So she asked Tib to get revenge on him. And she never saw the spirit again after that. She also said she saw old Chaddix and Anne Redfern making clay pictures, which is the clay dolls. Mm -hmm of three members of the Nutter family. The clay pictures were the voodoo doll things, and they were used to hurt, cause illness, or death. Odd, considering Alice Nutter was also charged, but anyway. On to the trials. The trials where the defendants were not allowed to have lawyers or call any witnesses. Oh, God. Yeah. On August 8th, it's surprising that anybody was ever acquitted. Yeah. They weren't allowed a defense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. how the fuck did anyone get it? Like, mm-hmm. this must, I mean, I want to believe this was a special case, but it's like, I'm just, they were all in, yeah. you know, all these fucking asshole prosecutors and the judges were in bed together going, mm-hmm. yeah, let's just, let's just, just fucking do it's it. poor yeah. people. It's, a, well, it's like a dozen look, less poor people in the world and it'll make us, you know, like, we'll look better we know King YouTube's Shark not a thing James. right now, but if it were a thing, we could totally do a series about yeah, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So on August 18th, 1612, mm. old, and I started looking this up on, in, on the 20th, mm. Mm. which is mm. the exact anniversary mm. of their hanging. Oh, God. I don't fucking get it. It creeps me out, though. So, okay, on August uh, 18th, 1612. Tell their story, Jerry. I tell will. Their story. I'm going to tell it. Old Taddex was charged with the murder of Robert Nutter and John Devis by witchcraft, turning a man- man's beer sour 20 years earlier heaven forbid, and also with having, without using the churn, produced a quantity of butter from a dish of skimmed milk. <laughs> Which is I like, mean, how I is that bad? I don't mean to laugh, but it's like, it's like... That's not bad. That's great. It's like, what's proof that Easy she's... butter? Fuck yeah. Easy, bu- easy butter. Easy butter. Anyway, oh, she initially denied the charges, but after her confession to Noel was read and a man testified against her, saying Nutter accused her of turning um, the guy's beer sour. So he had used, he lived with her like 20 years previously. Uh-huh. And he was like, oh, yeah, like uh, she turned this guy's beer sour because he thought that she had turned his beer sour. He thought the man who was Nutter thought that she had turned his beer sour. So that must be the truth. And then also uh, she was a known witch. So he testified that she was a known witch in the area. Wow, that's after compelling that, testimony. I know. But after that, she broke down and confessed and asked the judges to have mercy on her daughter, Anne Redfern. So most likely the confession was... She was trying to, plea, was trying basically to plea, bargain plea bargain on behalf of her family. On behalf of her family. It didn't work. Oh. Chaddix was found guilty. Elizabeth Devis was charged with the murders of two men and, together with Alice Nutter and Demdike, the murder of a third man. Elizabeth vehemently, 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 strongly denied all charges. I think the word you're looking for is vehemently? Vehemently. Or vehemently. Some vehemently. Say vehemently. 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 <laughs> strongly denied all charges. 
Apparently, Thomas Potts, the writer of The Discovery of Witches, mm. uh, he was not a fan of Elizabeth's. In fact, he described her as, and this is directly from the book, mm -hmm. this odious witch was branded with a preposterous mark in nature, even from her birth, which was her left eye standing lower than the other, the one looking down, the other looking up, so strangely deformed as the best that were present in that, the, in that honorable assembly did affirm they had not often seen the like. <laughs> so she was a little deformed, which did he's not He's basically help her. going like, whatever. She's like so ugly. She's such a four. I don't like her. Oh my God. Yeah. So it was Ugh. during Elizabeth's trial that Janet was brought forth to testify against her own mother mm. after spending four and a half months, most likely with the magistrate, with Noel. <sighs> when Elizabeth saw her, she freaked the fuck out. She started cursing and screaming at the little girl. Now, it could have been two things. It could have been maybe Janet wasn't treated very well and she was like, this fucking bitch. And so she started screaming at her. Yeah. But it could have also been she knew Janet didn't know the consequences of what she was about to say. And and could be. Elizabeth was trying to scream some sense into her to get through to her. Yeah. Yeah. That mm. also didn't work. Janet started crying. She asked the judges if they could remove her mother from the court because she was too afraid. So the judges took Elizabeth away, and then Janet crawled on top of a table and told the court she believed her mother had been a witch for three or four years. She also said her mother had a familiar called Ball who appeared in the shape of a brown dog. Janet claimed to have witnessed conversations between Ball and her mother in which Ball had been asked to help with various murders. James Devis also gave evidence against his mother. He was 14, saying he had seen her making a clay figure of one of her victims. <sighs> Elizabeth was found guilty. Naturally. James Devis, mm. again, a 14-year-old boy, was also charged. But he had already confessed to Noel, and Janet had testified that she had seen him asking a black dog he'd conjured up to kill the man he was accused of murdering with witchcraft. James had tried to kill himself in prison, mm. and by the time the trial came around, according to Potts, he was so insensible, weak, and unable in all things as he could neither speak, hear, or stand, but was holden up when he was brought to the place of the arraignment to receive his trial. Whether that was from the suicide attempt, mm. the cramped, filthy jail cell, or the stress of the trial, and so he had a breakdown, yeah. it's not known. Damn. James Devis was found guilty. On the 19th of August, the three Samelsbury women <laughs> Samelsbury. Samelsbury were tried for child murder and cannibalism. But Jesus. after the judge exposed the 14-year-old girl who testified them as a tool of a Catholic priest, they were found innocent. Huh. So basically, this little girl had said these women were witches, that they had killed this baby. The father of the baby was like, you know what? These weird things happened after she died. She said they were cannibalistic, mm -hmm. yada, yada, all of this stuff. Well, when the judge said to the women, hey, what's your defense? What do you have to say for yourselves? They said, question the little girl and say, ask her why she would say these things about us. And so the judges did. And when they did, the little girl broke down and started crying. And she said that this Jesuit priest had told her what to say to accuse mm. them. So the judges were asked the women again, why would this Jesuit priest say these things about you? Yeah. And they said, the only thing we can think of is because we're members of the Church of England and we're not Catholic. Oh. So that set up even more animosity yeah. towards Catholicism mm. in that courtroom. Damn. And according to Protestantism, Catholicism, Catholicism was closer to witchcraft than Christianity. Yeah, that's, that was the belief. Anne Redfern was also tried that day for the murder of Robert Nutter, but she was found innocent of that one. Mm. However, when she was tried for the murder of Robert Nutter's father, Christopher, old Demdike's confession was read, which accused Anne and several people were called forth to testify that Anne was more dangerous than her mother. She maintained her innocence, but she was also found guilty. Mm. Janet identified ah. Jane Bullcock and her son John as having attended the meeting at Malkin Tower, and they were both found guilty of murder by witchcraft. Whew. So, Alice Nutter is the unusual one. Everyone else accused was devastatingly poor. 
Alice was comparatively wealthy. She was from a wealthy landowning family and the widow of a tenant yeoman farmer. Socially, she was on the same level of no. Hmm. Why was she? Why would she be at their house having stolen lamb, mutton stew, you know? Yeah. Why would she do that? She did not speak up at the trial other than to state she was not guilty. Other than that, she remained silent. But Janet said she saw Alice at the meeting. We don't know if she was there. She could have stopped by to be supportive. But it was Good Friday, and we know Alice was Catholic. Two of her family members were Jesuit priests who had been put to death. I think they were drawn and quartered. Mm. We also know that Noel was out for Catholics. He was one of the magistrates who had agreed to round up and prosecute Catholics after that Easter specifically. They were papist elements in the witch's curses, and that made an implied link between witchcraft and Catholicism, and also made the perfect excuse to catch a few few Catholics in the same net. He must have been so proud of himself. Oh, what a fucker. Most likely, Alice was at Mass, and she remained quiet to avoid getting anyone else at Mass that Friday in trouble. Alice Nutter was found guilty. Her conviction was a message being sent. Oh. Yeah. Catherine Hewitt, a.k.a. Uh. Mold Heels, which I love. <laughs> Mold, Mold Heels. Heels. And Alice Gray were charged um, with the murder of a child. Janet also picked Catherine out of a lineup as someone who was present at the meeting. Catherine was found guilty. Alice was not. In, fa- in fact, out of the 12, Alice Gray was the only one found not guilty. And the way that they did, they made a show of this case. They paraded, mm. they did a full lineup in front of the court oh, where Janet would say, it's her. She's the witch. Out of the other um, people that had been arrested, they brought yeah. a whole bunch of them and had them line up. And she would pick out the people that, was at, that were at the party. Mm. Yeah. Mm. She was there. And you ate this. And you laughed at that joke. And you turned the spit. And that kind of stuff. Yeah. Allison was uh, Allison God, Devis. It's just infuriating. It's I know. Just, I'm so, I know. Ugh. Allison Devis was the last one tried, charged with causing harm using witchcraft. When John Law was brought into court to accuse her, she again fell on her knees and begged him for forgiveness. He said, "If she had injured him, surely she could cure him." She replied that she did not have that power, but her grandmother, if she was still alive, could have and would have cured him. Allison, of course, was found guilty. Let's see. The majority of the accused were convicted by the evidence provided by both James and Janet Devis. Hmm. This was despite the fact that the siblings' testimonies differed regarding the people at the meeting at Malkin Tower initially. In Janet's original statement, none of the defendants were mentioned. But at trial, she picked them all out. Hmm. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Convenient. There were also other witches, quote witches, added to the as the as the trial was nearing, they added mm-hmm. Margaret Pearson and Isabel Isabel R- Roby. Mm-hmm. Uh, Margaret was found guilty of causing harm, not death, so she was sentenced to the pillory. Okay. Isabel was sentenced to hang with the others, and it's interesting because <clears throat> Margaret was found guilty of causing harm. Allison was guilty of causing harm too, but she was put to death. And it maybe it's because what she the the stroke had such a, a terrible effect on him that you know it was worse than oh I stubbed my toe something I don't well know. and his son was so dead set against yes. her that like she was yeah, yeah. she was never going to get off with anything less than death right all and she was a teen as well Ugh. all ten defendants who were found guilty of murder were hanged at Gallows Hill on August twentieth sixteen twelve they were forced to stand on a box have a noose placed about their neck and then the box was moved. Slowly. Oh, so they didn't even, their necks didn't even snap. They were strangled to death. They were strangled to death. Oh, God. For some, it took 20 minutes to die. Oh. Yeah, it was real bad. Um, There are some people say that they were burned afterwards, but I I didn't see anything Mm. about that. So um, that could have just been something that they did to which, I knew they, I know they did it to witches, but I don't know if they did it to the Pendle witches or Mm. not. Okay. Before this trial, by law, a child had to be at least 14 to testify. However, in demonology, King James has stated that the rules can be changed to find witches. 
And Noel took James at his word. In fact, Noel pretty much used demonology as a guideline for the entire fucking trial. It was like, oh, oh, they're supposed to have familiars. So you guys have familiars? Great. Okay, so they're supposed to be a group. Okay, so the, okay. This group, okay. It was like he was checking off a list Jesus of all Christ. of the things. And Janet helped him do that. Um, and how old was Janet at the time? She was a kid. Ten. She was ten. Nine, she ten. Was ten. Yeah, and she, ten, Ugh. yeah. And she, you know, the accounts were that she was very calm. She was very clear. She knew exactly what she was saying. And, you know, the feeling, looking back on it, was that it was rehearsed. Sure. She had practiced it. Well, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, this guy is like going, hey, you know, you're living with me now. Life is easier yeah. for you than living in crushing poverty. And, right. you know. You know, and it's not hard to get a 10 year old child angry at her mother. Well, and, and you think too, if she was indeed treated differently, mm-hmm. um, you know, he could have convinced her that she really was a witch and that if she lived with her, you know, that yeah. she was evil and she was going to, you know, be taken down the path of evil and all of the stuff. So mm-hmm. he was a zealot. So he probably used a lot of those. Yeah, probably. Religious fears on her. Um, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, after the trial, a reference handbook for magistrates was written, and which used the testimony Janet Device provided, as well as Thomas Potts' writings, to show that children could indeed testify. It was called, um, oh gosh, what was it called? Country, country law, country. Common law? No, it was country something. So it was mostly used. I can't believe I didn't write it down. Um, it was mostly used as for people who weren't in cities. So okay. if they had questions about how the law was supposed to be dealt with, they would look up this book. And in that book was this trial specifically. Wow. Yeah. The handbook was used all over the UK and America including Salem, Massachusetts, Mm. where in 1692, 19 people were hanged based mostly on testimony from children. From children. So what happened to Janet? Well, not much is known until 1633. A young boy of 10, Edmund Robinson, accused 17 people of witchcraft, and Janet was one of those people. Oh. Eventually, it was discovered that he had made up a story about being attacked by a witch so he wouldn't get in trouble for being late, and his father started blackmailing people in town. If they didn't pay up, his son would add them to the list. Everyone accused, yeah, everyone accused ended up being acquitted, but the defendants had to pay for their lodging while they were in prison before they would be let out. So for someone who was poor, like Janet, that was most likely never possible. Damn. There are no records of Janet after 1636. So she just disappeared into the prison system. Mm -hmm. Oh, God, that's awful. Mm -hmm. What a fucking infuriating story. I know. I know. (sighs) And so it's kind of, yes, there was this magical element that was Mm -hmm. being used. Um. And, you know, with the confessions and everything, it was believed. And and some people will report, oh, yes, they were these witches. They were horrible, blah, blah, blah. But they, the confessions were after interrogations. Yeah. An interrogation of a teenage girl and an old woman, a teenage boy to start with. Mm. So. Oh, God. And Anne Redfern, Chaddix's, old Chaddix's daughter, mm. She never confessed anything. She always said no. She was the one, though, that was not an old woman and not a child. Mm. And so the one, the, the the women that didn't confess generally were the the ones that weren't old and weren't children. And they were like, "I didn't do it. I'm not guilty." Oh. And so yeah. And and it, interestingly, the Nutter family still lives in the area. Mm. Like those families, the descendants of these witches wow. still live Oof. in that area because, of course, England, that's what happens, you know, for yeah. 400 plus Just years. Stick around for a long Roots. Yeah. Roots. 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 You lay down, you, you put down yeah. some roots. And so because of these deaths, like there is a statue of, um, of Alice Nutter mm. um, with her back facing the court. She's walking away, mm. which is making a statement about that. And um, it's right next to a road, so I'm sure it scares people at night. They're like, oh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Man. but the hill is supposedly very haunted, as are some of the areas around town yeah. uh, where the witches used to live. Mm-hmm. But 
this story was so long. Are We're you... going to have to wait to get in the off hauntings <gasps> until next time. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh, it's so great, so though. So good, though. I can't believe we've never... Yeah. I, I mean, it's never... so big. And, like, the reason that people are children now testify goes back to this fucking case. Wow. And that's why... And, and of course, now... We're much more careful about children's testimony. Well, do you remember back in the eighties when there was the whole satanic daycare uh-huh. scare, where yes. everyone was like, if you know, there was, I forget what family was accused um, mm-hmm. and went to trial, but a lot of it it called into question, like all these children, these children that were daycare school mm-hmm. age, um, were brought uh, to trial to testify, and they would just, of course, say all these horrible things. And they found that these kids weren't even necessarily coached. It was just that the therapist that had kind of put them under hypnosis or that was kind of um, going into this repressed memory Mm -hmm. uh, territory, which was a very contested theory at the time, still is, um, that the therapist didn't know, because there's since been a lot of really good research done in this, that the therapist was essentially um, unconsciously guiding these children to say what they yeah, wanted leading to hear. questions and, and these are kids these are children some yeah. of them you know younger than five they have no clue the implications of what they're saying yeah but they'll just say oh yeah you know we were there and it was only after that some of the children got on and were like that the, the claims became so obtuse so impossible that people started going yeah these kids they're they're just making shit up because the, all they know is well that's what the adults want to hear and right. and it's so unconscious like in their mind it's like a child's not always able to tell the difference between something they imagined and something that actually happened mm-hmm. um, so it it started this whole conversation but there was there was a time in the not so distant past here in you know in America where people were essentially being accused and tried for witchcraft yeah uh, you know and like Same saying thing. all kinds of things oh mm-hmm. yeah well they murdered like dozens of kids you know, every year or something like that. And people were like, how? Right. Where, who are these kids? Who are these kids? Were there, were there yeah. that many unaccounted for children that who could that could just go missing and murdered? And, and right. people, there are people out there that still believe that shit. Well, and I mean, in the 80s, there were a lot of kids that got kidnapped. Though. There were, but they got, but we know about them. Yes. But like for a bunch of kids to just like, some of these witnesses would get up on the stand against these families that ran the daycare or that ran various daycares because this happened all over the country for a few years mm-hmm. where everyone was like, oh yeah, my, my, you know, I think my daycare care provider might be a satanist it was just madness yeah absolute fucking madness brought on by some fucking crazy religious zealots who see witches everywhere um just because they happen to believe differently than they do oh my god Mm -hmm. you're you know there's um i mean it's just it's insane and uh but it's got to the point where people saying wait a minute are that can that many people be really being sacrificed and we don't know like no bodies turning right. up whatever and and that's not I and mean, the sad thing is is that's not to say that occasionally murders don't happen that are motivated by that kind of thing right they do happen and now it's hard but it's so it's just man it it's such a murky fucking issue but it's largely driven by just plain bullshit yep that you know by the, it's it's it, they go back motives. to it ulterior motives it's people who are just had they have a petty fucking vendetta against someone and they're mm-hmm. like what's the best way to take this person down oh i'll know i'll equate them to this really horrible thing everyone you're hates right now you're yeah. a witch or you're a catholic right. or you're gay or you're yeah. you know whatever you're a gay witchy catholic yeah now it's your an sjw millennial or right or you know whatever it's like there's just whatever group of people that everyone that a certain group of people hates yeah it's just like you're one of those now here's it's just so fucking stupid right. it's just such a waste it really is such a fucking it really is. waste and that's the thing you know now of course especially after this satanic panic we know not to do these leading questions we know how to better ask children who mm-hmm. have been through these kinds of situations not witchcraft situations but have who have been abused who've or, been abused or know. we need to testify we need them yeah. to tell what happened to them um, because they should be heard too. Mm-hmm. Just because they're children doesn't mean they shouldn't be heard. No, absolutely. But but you have to interview them in, in a way know. that's nuanced and subtle, right. so that you don't accidentally lead them. And so that into they're not being not used true. as a to strike a vendetta. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. And so back then, though, it's it, this is the trial yeah. that made that all of that possible. Oof. And if it wasn't for Janet's testimony at ten years old. She couldn't have been accused of being a witch either. Damn. And, you know, there was no evidence. There was no, you know, um, you know, by the time, and the thing is with her case, by the time that trial came about, it was 25 years later. Mm-hmm. James, I don't think he was on the throne at this point, but he became much more skeptical the older he got. Yeah. And he had caught some boy lying about witches. 
um, and that he had seen witches and blah, blah, blah. And when the kid got questioned, he confessed that he had been lying about the whole thing, mm. which cha changed James' perspective on what was happening. So the the culture changed as well at the same time mm -hmm. as James became more skeptical, people became more skeptical. And uh, that's why with this particular trial um, that Edmund pointed the finger at all of these women, including Janet, like it's written in there that, and and we don't know for sure if it's her, but it was the same area, same name, mm. seems likely it was her. Yeah. Uh, the, they found the the nipple like the mark yeah you know the extra nipple and the places where they found the marks would be in like the nether regions between the nethers and the ne backside like really <laughs> intimate areas so beyond being accused of being witches their bodies were completely oh they just searched became, over yeah. and picked apart and there's a lot of and there was a lot of just vile men in positions uh -huh. of in, in um, of inquiry that were like well let's uh, let's look for that devil mark lady to throw you know it's right. just like they're just right. doing it because they get a fucking mm -hmm. weird like thrill yeah. sexual thrill out of just making a woman completely their subject yeah and so what happened is several of the women were sent to london and um, for more investigations and in London, that uh, the, the investigator mm -hmm. did not buy the witch bullshit. Mm -hmm. So he in, called in midwives to look them over. And they said that all of these markings were not anything that wasn't natural. It was all bullshit. And that's when eventually Edmund confessed because they found out. <laughs> men being like, tell me what a vagina looks like. We don't know. We've never seen one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So. Uh, no, but I was like, it's perfectly normal for them yeah, to go that is, way. It's, yeah, that's a perfect. This is a per This is, we all have that, that's by right. the way. I just, freckle. yeah, we all have it's that. A it's a freckle. It's yeah. a freckle. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and the guys are fascinating, fascinating. Oh, interesting. interesting. <laughs> yeah. And so that's why they were all acquitted. But then, of course, poverty. Yeah. You were stuck. You can't win. You can't, you can't win. win. And the legal system is still very much like that in mm -hmm. those countries where it's like, it's so. It certainly is in this country. <sighs> well, certainly in this country where, you know, so it's, yeah, man. Yeah. It's just so fucked. It's so fucked. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's so fucked. That is. I kind the of story. wish witches were real just so all these fucking assholes. That's what. My whole thing was is like could be cursed by someone. I know because they got away like, with it. They fucking got away with it every yeah. time. They got away. This this Noel guy probably went on to get keep his yep. fucking wealth and get mm -hmm. famous and curry favor with uh -huh. magistrates and royals and, and shit like yep. that. And uh -huh. where the fuck you know where's Absolutely. his ironic justice? It's no, it's no fucking wonder that people um, tended to who were poor tended to believe in witchcraft. It yeah. was it was a very like, God, it was the only way they could ever even have hope of being vindicated. Right. Of like, well, if we can, maybe we can just pretend to curse that guy and maybe something will happen. We could take credit for it so that they could at least feel like, so oh, fucking. Well, and that's know, the thought somebody, with... got, somebody that fucked me over finally got yeah. their justice. And that's the thought with Allison initially confessing to Noel mm -hmm. that she was like, okay, they were poor. They were, their house was made fun of. They were mocked. Her sister was illegitimate. This was her chance to be like, oh yeah, my family's powerful. Yeah, this is what we can do. And that's the thing. I mean, and that's when, when you are when you're not when you it. feel when you don't have power, like when you are absolutely disenfranchised, like and if people start and I know this as a as you know someone who grew up gay in the South in the '80s, mm -hmm. like fucking at some point you just kind of embrace the stereotype that that Sorry. people <laughs> at some point you just embrace the stereotype that people you know uh, uh squeeze you into just to make it your own and subversive mm -hmm. and freak them out with it you're like yeah. okay i'm not gonna be afraid of being called a queer i'm gonna be queer as hell and make you uncomfortable as fucking possible right like and that that and it's very empowering to do that so i can totally see someone that's thought of as a witch going yeah i mean cool that gives me a little bit of uh gives me a little bit of a status right a little bit of power over for people at least yeah. psychologically and it's well, and the thing fucking, maybe the only thing you got going for you is especially in modern times i feel like you should not trust a poor witch <laughs> because if you are really a witch why aren't you <laughs> doing some spells <laughs> i remember this is this a funny recollection of when i was in uh, i was hanging out with um fuck, i was in my 20s so a long time ago like 1600s mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, <laughs> 16, I was hanging, yeah, 1612. I was hanging out with these people that lived in like shit tower. Uh, <laughs> what was it called? Can't remember. Anyway, so, uh, but no, at some point there was some really into it, like pagan 
And, and is by no means am I trying to dog on pagans or Wiccans or, or, or witches at modern day. I love you all. But there are, among those people, there are always the arrogant know-it-alls. Yes. Like, there isn't any walk of life. You're like, well, actually, it's this. And you're like, yeah. oh, God, everyone hates you. Yeah. Hey, you'd be this way if you flew kites. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just no one can fly a kite as well as you can. <sighs> we fucking get it. Is there anything um, worse than a know-it-all kite flyer? <laughs> <laughs> well, and this person was going on about, you know, like, oh, well, you know, we went and we were talking. I guess we were talking about rituals of like getting money and how, how do you know, do this? And they're like, well, what you need to do. You had, and, and this person had this big description of how they'd gone in the woods and done this really complicated naked ritual. It sounded like fun. No kidding. That except was just something you want to do. Fuck well, except that. For, <laughs> like, hope they brought some off with them. <laughs> but, uh, but they went with this complicated ritual and there was some total skeptic, uh, hipster that was in the group that just kind of turned them after this huge long description of this really complicated ritual and just said, or you could just get a fucking job. Job. <laughs> <laughs> they never talked about their right. belief after that. It was, yeah. I mean, it was just kind of like, bro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like, you're going to touch the divine. Maybe, maybe, maybe you don't. It's like, it's like, I don't know. It's like praying to God or whoever you pray to and like really hard because you just really want an extra hour of sleep. Mm -hmm. It's like there's so many other things you could be asking for. <laughs> like, so get the big maybe, stuff first. Maybe wisdom, you know, or, or to be one with everything or something and be like, right. I just, you know, I'd really like a slice of pineapple pizza. Right. <laughs> Great. Great. But, you know, to each their own. That's true. That's true. Well, thank you for no sharing that story. No problem. I'm oh, man, it's interesting. very excited to find out more about the hauntings now. Yeah, me too. So, oh my in God. depth. I was like, oh, I don't have time to do the haunting. I don't even have time to research it because I was in so deep. Yeah. yeah oh, so. shit. Well, thank, thank you. And you. thank you for your story. And thank you guys for listening. We'll catch you next time. And remember, it's, it's okay, okay to sleep with, with the lights on. on.